So that, that, that's a great question and incredibly difficult to, to answer. So I'm going to take a, a stab at a couple of, uh, of answers from, from other people, if that's OK. So um, Professor Paul Kearney up at uh, Strathclyde in his politics and policy blog uh, lists a couple of different definitions of, um, uh, of what public policy is. Um, and, uh, and I've got a favourite one and I'll, I'll finish on that one. So um, from, from Cochrane uh, the, in 2005, uh, the public policy is the actions of government and the intentions that determine those actions. You know, that, 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 seems, that seems kind of sensible, but maybe not particularly specific. Um, Col Colbatch in 98 says um, uh, uh, public policy is diverse activities by different bodies that are drawn together into a stable and predictable pattern of action, which as often as not uh, comes to be labelled as policy. So a, a bit of a, an indication there that it should be something which is sensible and coherent, which is brought together, but not always is that the, the case. Um, Die in 2005 gives the uh, the definition which I most favour, which is public policy is whatever governments choose to do or to not to do. And I think that's probably the best working definition. So often the work that we do is helping government to uh, perhaps not do something as much as it is to do a new thing or indeed to make some tweaks and changes to something which is already doing. So that's a long winded answer, I think, there to be able to say public policy is is almost everything uh, or indeed nothing that a government does. Yeah, absolutely. So I think perhaps it's useful just to be able to put a, a framework in place that I'm going to be speaking about um, uh, representative democracies and how public policy is formed in, in, in that kind of governmental setup. Mm -hmm. uh, this varies to, uh, in other forms of, uh, of government setup. Um, so th there are a number of different push and pull factors which will lead to policy being generated or indeed policy being enacted and becoming a priority for any government of the day. So. So a, a formal mechanism that you might uh, uh, consider and be aware of is that a uh, political party will publish its manifesto in an election cycle um, and in the uh, in the UK setup will then have uh, uh, its Queen's speech where it will outline its uh, legislative agenda based on those um, uh, manifesto promises and look to be able to, to deliver those. So that's a really straightforward way where uh, a political party will say this is what we'd do if we were to have power. Um, power is given by the uh, by the population and therefore they, they, they go about enacting that agenda. Um, but that's a very set piece way of, of it happening. Um, and there's this great um, uh, 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 phrase that, that echoes through history that it's um, uh, and it's super gendered, but, um, but this is uh, it's events, dear boy, events. So um, things happen. Life comes at you fast when you're government and challenges that you may not perceive necessarily while you are uh, writing your manifesto suddenly need to be dealt with. Of course, the COVID crisis is a, is a stellar example of that that we've all seen writ large in our, in our lives. So sometimes things can just happen and that can be um, uh, 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 from public health crises to um, uh, 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 military engagement uh, overseas to um, all sorts of in, in internal crises which require a, a response. And then there's some other things which are slightly more organised. So um, uh, advocacy groups from uh, non-governmental organisations to uh, community-led groups to individual uh, citizens can make uh, uh, plays for government's ear to be able to address policies. And during the COVID crisis, I guess the, the example that lots of people are aware of is uh, Marcus uh, uh, Rashford uh, being able to uh, lobby government to extend the provision of free school meals over the um, over the period of time that schools were not formally uh, coming together in a physical sense. So, um, so that, that that's an example of a. Uh, I guess a celebrity, a, a, a well-known person being able to advocate for, for change within, within government. 
and then there are a, a number of other pieces of, of activities which are which are happening whereby um, a government has a, a series of things which perhaps weren't manifesto promises but nonetheless need to be things that are delivered of which the government will be consulting with relevant stakeholders to be able to shape what that policy might be and then to either enact guideline change um, or to go through primary or secondary legislation through um, uh, uh, through parliament so, so lots of different ways uh, is uh, is the answer uh, shorthand answer there. amazing thank you so much and i think when we think about Marcus Rashford, as you say, is uh, that really uh, that example that comes to mind during the pandemic of something that was very effective. But when we looked at it, it seems almost it seems so easy and quick that mm. this celebrity he posts something on social media, he you know he gets a lot of traction. Um, government says no in in the first place, then does a U turn a few few weeks later. But actually, that process of advocacy, it's not it's never normally that rapid, is no. it? So, um, does no, it so, so it's not the, the Rashford example is, is a really good example of um, uh, uh, of things happening fast. Um, I, I, I would suggest that, you know, part of that is it's just so incredibly difficult for any government to manage a crisis of the scale of um, uh, of COVID. Um, and, and as such, government is doing quite a lot of thinking on its feet, which means that the opportunity for what's covered in the press as a, a U-turn, but you could also argue as a, if you're being more generous in your language, as a, as a course correction um, or as a response to changing circumstances, does mean that government does act uh, often quite quickly based on um, uh, popular pressure, normally articulated or historically articulated through the press um, and campaigning uh, uh, articles within uh, newspapers. Um, but, 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 some, but as we, as we see with the, with the Rashford case, using the, the power of that uh, 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 celebrity via social media to be able to, to make change and, and, and make that change irresistible to uh, to government to, to in order to, to take on board so yeah definitely not normal but not entirely un, unheard of for government to be able to make change but quite unique circumstances for that to happen um uh, uh, last year so so in terms of the uh, the attributes that, uh, that that are required um in terms of being able to engage successfully with government i think the the primary one is tenacity being able to continue to um uh, to pick yourself up and uh, and dust yourself off when you've made a, a play to be able to get a, a civil servant or an elected representative to pay attention to your topic and it just hasn't quite got traction at that time and the, the reason i think that tenacity is super important is that things not getting traction at one time doesn't mean that they're not a good idea or indeed the right thing or what government may choose to do at some point in the future it's just the other circumstantial situation isn't there to be able to support it at that point but you may find that there's a change of minister and that she particularly favors this direction of policy that you're advocating for um, or you may find that there's a, a change of government or a change of prime minister and suddenly a, a topic becomes accessible and government wants answers or or evidence or positions to be able to, uh, to, to take. So the, the, the quality of tenacity is really important for you to be able to be ready to take opportunities as they present themselves um, and to expect um, that you'll get lots of no's before you get a yes. So, so there are uh inherent perils with being too closely associated with one advocacy group or another uh, as a as an academic and being able to speak uh, <clears throat> well, I want to go with that um so and uh, and that tension is uh, uh, can be really quite useful. So um, uh, the an, an established advocacy group will have uh, lines into government, will have a particular agenda that it's looking to push, will have resources to be able to do that. And as an academic, um, being able to to tap into that network can really push you along in terms of your engagement, which otherwise you'd spend quite a bit of uh, resource in terms of time and perhaps money in in growing that network yourself. So that there is a an, an obvious opportunity 
opportunity uh, there to be able to, uh, to to go further. What what I would um, uh, uh, urge academics to consider is the credibility argument. So for those within government, is it easy to um, uh, to be dismissed by being too uh, by a civil servant or by an elected uh, politician um, by uh, being perceived to be the academic for a particular uh, argument rather than being somebody who is presenting evidence in an impartial sense and there is a there's there's an element of which uh, it's it's fine to be that academic associated with a particular point but the 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 risk is that your uh, the evidence that you produce is discounted because of your proximity to a particular uh, argument or um or advocacy group so there is a there's a degree of tension there about how close to be able to uh, to to get with uh, with a particular um, advocacy uh, group or, 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 or argument. Um, so uh, Public Policy Southampton or, or PPS is uh, the knowledge brokerage unit at the University of Southampton. So we sit within part of the university, which is a, a non-academic grouping called the uh, uh, Research Innovation Service. And uh, the this uh, directorate in which we um, uh, reside looks to be able to uh, support academics to be able to uh, win grants and to be able to uh, achieve impact either in terms of uh, enterprise engagement or uh, engagement with the public or indeed engagement with the public policy ecosystem which is the the area of the uh, part of the world that I'm interested in. Um, it, in terms of ways that um, uh, the undergraduate students can become involved and, uh, and have a, a better understanding of the work that we do I'd, I'd thoroughly encourage them to be able to um, uh, follow us on Twitter at public policy UOS um, uh, keep up to date with um, and, and, and come uh, uh, follow us via LinkedIn at uh, uh, linkedin.com forward slash showcase forward slash uh, public policy UOS. Um, we also have a, a series of podcasts which are um, uh, being launched on the um, oh goodness, 20th of April, um, and those are uh, coming out on a fortnightly basis. Uh, they'll be trailed on the on the Twitter account, so people can can listen in and get a bit of an understanding from academic members of staff who have uh, influenced policy and engaged with uh, with the policy making process. Um, really, starting from what they did for their A levels all the way through to what was their most recent engagement with uh, uh, with government and, and and hopefully that work will um, uh, demystify some of the the process of, of public policy engagement and the the uh, the, the other really uh, exciting opportunity that uh, that students may wish to be able to pursue is an internship with with PPS so on a, on an annual basis we recruit um, interns to come and work within the the team to work on a, a variety of topics as as Laura has spoken to um, and also looking after our um, uh, social media engagement and uh, being able to support with a, a variety of different projects including uh, responding to government consultations um, or parliamentary inquiries so um, the those adverts go out on the on the Twitter account so again that's a, a really good place to be able to uh, uh, to look at um, there, there's a wealth of information on our uh, web pages um, so do take a look at um, www.southampton.ac.uk forward slash public policy um, to find out more information and practical hints and uh, and tips Yes, um, so it's kind of a, a long journey starting um, in my undergraduate years. Um, so for context, I did my dissertation on representations of sexual violence within two books, um, one being Nawal El Sadawi's Woman at Point Zero, um, and the second one being Keshwa Desi's Sea of Innocence. Um, and within that dissertation, I essentially talked about how sexual violence was represented, talked about the language that was used, and how we can use that to gain insight into those varying countries um, and areas and different issues um, around sexual violence and how we respond to it, how we talk about it and all of these different things. 
So after my third year, um, I was elected as the VP Welfare and Community for Southampton Students' Union. Um, so for all intents and purposes, I was essentially a decision maker. Um, I was an elected representative um, within a small organisation. And um, even though I'd spent my dissertation time talking about um, how literature can be used within policy and exploring policy making for the first time, um, I was suddenly hit with the realisation that actually being a decision maker is a lot harder <laughs> than it actually looks from the outside. Um, and it's not as simple um, as I was always critiquing it to be. Um, so I spent that year doing that. And then um, as part of an agreement between the university and the students union, um, I was offered an internship um, at some place in the university. Um, so with Giles and um, he was very nice enough to accept me um, into the PPS team. And um, I've just been with them for, I think, nearly 10 months now, um, exploring public policy kind of in its entirety, learning a lot, um, having a go at responding to consultations myself. Um, I did a policy brief at the beginning of the year as well around um, gendered, uh, making online education more gender friendly. Um, and I've also been leading on an EDNI plan as well for the unit. So um, that's been my kind of general journey in that sense. Yeah, I wouldn't say I understand it in its entirety at all. I don't think I ever will. Um, I don't think anyone ever would. It's kind of an always fluctuating and growing issue. Um, but it's definitely been really interesting in learning how um, things like, so, you know, arts and humanities, studying literature, studying fiction or even poetry, um, they don't really seem to intuitively belong in something like policy making, um, because policy making is uh, seems to be from the outside all about politics. And and when we talk about evidence based policy making, there's always a lot of um, association with science and really objective facts and everything like that. Um, and a big inspiration of my research has been um, a, an academic called Donna Haraway, who um, looked at this idea of standpoint theory, um, and she essentially challenged the um, uh, pro the um, uh, meaning of scientific knowledge to, to not be objective as everyone thinks it is. Historically, it has been kind of um, built on the foundation of male epistemo epistemologies um, and male knowledges, and in particular white male as well, um, and trying to understand that things that we consider fact aren't necessarily 100% objective fact. So we need to be gathering lived experiences and different perspectives from all different places that we can um, so that we're not trying to look at it as if we're, you know, a god essentially looking down on something and saying this is it because I can see it this way. Um, Sorry about that bang accent, he hit my table. <laughs> um, so, so that has really inspired that knowledge and trying to figure out how we can take fiction and poetry and the language analysis within that and apply it to policy um, has been quite difficult. Um, but I think it's really important um, if I take the uh, Sea of Innocence example um, as one example to situate this. Um, it is a book that is centred around um, the rape of a woman who um, is a tourist, a British white woman who is a tourist who goes to Goa in India. Um, and she um, experiences sexual violence um, while she's over there and is seen and talked about through the lens of this detective who is trying to figure out her crime. The actual scene itself where she experiences this sexual violence is the, um, I won't go into detail about it, but it is the excerpt that I, I analysed. Um, and a lot of it was basically talking about how it was decentering this victim in their own experience. Everything was being done to this victim. There was no talk about what this victim was experiencing or feeling or anything like that. And a lot of that analysis was very indicative of generally um, how rape in India is talked about within law, within public sphere um, and within academia as well. A lot of it is decentering the victim in their own narratives. And this is then reflected in how we try to come up with policy solutions in that sense as well. So that that has a pretty big insight um, and that's been really interesting. And the final thing would just really be like understanding the, the main challenge in that trying to get policymakers to understand why literature is so important in their decision making. Um, they're not exactly going to be like, OK, so I'm going to go read these four books by these four authors that seem to be popular at the time and that makes them legitimate. Um, it's not as simple as that. Policymakers are very time poor um, they aren't going to be experts in the area that you are an expert in. That's exactly why we need academics. Um, and it's even got the own bias and challenge of, you know, say if I was going to go to a policymaker and say, I've read X amount of books and I think this, that carries my own bias and my own perspective, which would go against the whole point of lived experiences and all the perspectives that we need to make something more empathetic or holistic or actually address the issue that it's addressing. Um, so yeah, th those are my insights.
Um, yeah, I would say there's a very long way to go. Um, I think even if you look at the areas of research interest, for example, that the government um, are putting out, there is a lot there about scientific fact and technological innovation and a lot around that kind of evidence. Um, and the Ministry of Justice, for example, is actually going more towards um, the qualitative part of it. So they are trying to collect the actual lived experiences of people who have gone through various justice systems or who have experienced anything to do with their remit. Um, and that's a really, really positive step because they're not just looking at the numbers, they're not treating humans as numbers um, and they're not treating experiences as numbers. They are recognising that all of these are very complex and nuanced and multifaceted, whereas there are some other departments who um, could probably use the qualitative a little bit more, um, especially if we think around like issues such as sustainable development um, with issues around carbon offsetting or reforestation and how you know the global north is using the global south as a kind of carbon sink. Um, there is a lot of, um, there is a lack of human element there in that carbon is being kind of personified almost um, in the way that it's, it's made a material substance by its use in relationship to humans. But then the people, for example, like in Uganda, in a national park, there was a carbon offsetting project there. The people are being dehumanised um, because they're being dispossessed. Their um, land is being accumulated. Their land is being grabbed. Um, there have been reports of human rights abuses in the name of a trade off. So to be um, ecologically sustainable and to do reforestation projects um, and understanding those lived experiences there are so important to make sure we're not just continuing, a, a, you know, an era of what I would call ecological colonialism um, and it is through fiction and it's through things like po poetry um, and literature where these lived experiences are palatable and they're more consumable and they're more exposed to people um, because no one's going to listen to you know the average person who's just been dispossessed you know then they're, they're that doesn't get in the media, but a best-selling book um, which, you know, surrounds that issue in a way that is accessible to thousands and thousands of people um, is going to reach that. And then finally, it might actually, you know, not exactly solve the issue, but it could contribute to a solution. Um, so I think the UK government could do a lot better with, with in that aspect. It's, it's difficult. Um, I think it's particularly difficult to answer in the year of 2020, 2021, because there's so much political divide that it kind of feels like if you're not with me, then you're against me, um, which in some cases is very true. Um, we saw Black Lives Matter saying silence is violence. And in a lot of cases, that is very, very true. Um, I think it comes down to there needing to be a more empathetic and a collaborative and interdisciplinary approach to all of these issues. The, the issue with the race report is that the, the data and the evidence that it was supposedly using, again, came down to, to numbers and methods that it had um, collected rather than the lived experiences of the entire country as a whole um, or the even entire community. Um, there was such a lack of nuance and complexity within that because it was so clear that it failed to even just talk to people that it disagreed with. Um, and when I say it, yeah, I mean, you know, the UK government, um, there was, there, they need to keep up an image, they need to keep up um, some kind of, um, you know, like image basically. Um, and so they're going to be talking, you know, around that. And, and that's that's normal for, we, we see that with organisations and corporations and anyone who has a public image, like you're, you're going to be supporting your image. You don't want to challenge that publicly. Um, and, and that's why I think, you know, using things like literature or fiction or policy or anything that is surrounding lived experiences is so needed because we need to challenge those kind of knowledges and we need to challenge the systems that those knowledges are built upon. Um, using the UK as an example, you know, we're, we're starting to go towards a more even gender split, but it's still incredibly white. Um, there is a lack of um, different sexualities, different genders, all of these different characteristics who bring different lived experiences into the policy realm and who are making these decisions or advocating for certain policies and having these perspectives um, and so the knowledge that it's accepting is going to be more closely related to their own biases um, you know confirmation bias is a, a very common thing that people fail to challenge within themselves um, so I'm not sure if that answers your questions in, your question in total um, I think there is a danger of academics being um, I, I, I I don't think there's a danger of academics being too close um, unless they are using their evidence as confirmation bias because your evidence and your collection needs to be impartial but when you what you put forward can be used to advocate for something that you know is true um, but I think also on the other side the UK government um, whether what party it is needs to step back from itself um, and its reputation and needs to be more empathetic in its approach.
Um, well, I kind of feel like I'd be advising myself three years ago um, as such for, well, you know, when I was trying to be that activist, um, I did a lot of stuff in the university around sexual violence, which taught me a lot of things, but um, a lot of things I did get wrong in the meantime as well, which I've learned, you know, through public policy and, and the um, uh, experience that I've had with, with the team as well um, has really shed light on that. So I would say um, be authentic and don't feel like you have to be and I'm going to challenge Giles on this, but don't feel like you have to be 100% neutral on everything in order to be legitimate or validated. Um, being impartial and having evidence and research is so, so important. You can't just go into a room and say, this is my opinion. And as passionate as you sound, it's, it's not exactly going to say, it's not exactly going to necessarily be the right opinion and the right solution. Um, so being research based and evidence based as much as possible is so, so important. Um, and making sure that you're not assigning yourself as an ambassador to that policy solution or to that um, uh, uh, issue that you're trying to solve because I think you know as we were talking about with the Marcus Rashford case it is so rare that only ever one person um, goes through that policy making process all of the change that I've done as an activist has just has been because I'm a loud person and I want to get things done but the foundation that I am working on has been from loads of other people before me or the conditions were set right I know the right people all of these kind of things um, so don't take it just upon yourself as one person and assign yourself that ambassadorial role um, platform make sure that your platform is shared by other people um, as much as possible as well because a louder voice is always going to be a more powerful one.